important for however many years. <coughs> On examination, he's pyrexial, he's tachycardic. His BP's okay, we don't know what he normally runs up, might be a bit low. His resps are up. His sats are not right at the top, not too bad on rim air. He's got dry mucous membranes, his skin tone is poor, he's got crackles in the right lower chest, and he's slightly confused. What do we think is going on? Hmm? Yeah, okay. So we said acute infection could be one of the main precipitants to DKA. So in this guy, it's seeming likely that he might have a low respiratory tract infection that's precipitated the DKA. What investigations do you want? Talk about ABG, FBM, test engineering. Yeah, okay. Good, I've heard some good things. So, we want a, a capillary blood glucose, BM. This is unrecordable, and you find this quite often in patients with DKA. You, you just don't get a reading, it's so high. We've got a set of biochem, urea is 10.2, creatinine is 1.23, sodium is 1.52, potassium 5.5. What sort of picture is that? Yeah, everything's high, it's general dehydration. Um, we've got an FBC, HB's fine, white cells are up as well. We've got urine ketones plus, plus, plus. Now, someone said ABG. Do we always need an ABG? Yeah, okay. So if you're worried in any way about the oxygenation, and in this chat we might be actually, because we're thinking he might have an infection, his resps are up, etc. Um, we could consider an ABG, but arguably you don't need one. You need to run a sample through the machine. That can be a BBG. You just need to know the pH, essentially. So this might be this guy's ABG. His pH is down, 7.21. Oxygenation is fine on Romare. <coughs> What's happening to the CO2? Yeah, exactly. And the bicarb, what's that doing? It's low, okay. So what have we got? What picture have we got? Exactly. Partially compensated metabolic acetases. And someone said chest x-ray as well. We've got signs of chest infection in this guy. Just because he's got the DKA, we're not ignoring um, the rest. If you're worried about infection, you don't have a more likely cause, and you've got positive urine dips, and an MSU as well. ECG, his potassium wasn't so bad. If the potassium is much higher, you might see some hypovolemic changes. Um, also, in people with any cardiac risk, the DKA can be precipitated by an infarct. So have a look at that as well if there's any clinical suspicion. So, let's go back. What are the main features of our management in this guy? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And don't forget the underlying cause, the underlying precipitant as well. So, the, I don't know what it is, English or European Society of Diabetologists or something, all these management are their guidelines. They say that within hour one, you need to have started your initial, immediate management upon diagnosis. So your ABC assessment we've gone through. Site so two wide bore cannula, you're going to need it for insulin infusion, you're going to need it for fluid infusion. Um, and as discussed, the clinical assessment, considering the precipitating causes, then we've said the three major steps immediately are fluid replacement. So you want to assess this guy's fluid status. If they're hypovolemic, what are we going to do? <laughs> Yeah, so some boluses, and you, you're going to need a senior review if you've got a hypovolemic patient with DKA. You're not going to be able to manage this on your own. So start your fluid boluses. Consider other causes of hypovolemia as well. Um, and if this patient isn't responding to the fluid boluses, so this is something like two 500 mil bags, normal saline or a colloid, consider contacting critical care at this stage. If they're normovolemic, this is a typical regime that you'd give a 70 kilogram adult. So, first hour, one bag of normal saline. Potassium or not? No. no. Why not? Yeah, we've already got a high potassium. We've not yet got going with the thing that's going to drive the potassium down. 
every bag after that, dependent on your continuous monitoring of the potassium situation, should have potassium in it. So, for the next two hours and the two hours after that, one bag of normal saline with potassium in it. Um, then the same again twice over the next eight hours. Okay, four hour bag, four hour bag, and then a six hour bag. That is the kind of general recommended standard thing um, that is obviously up for negotiation depending on your patient on a case to case basis. At 12 hours, you need to reassess, consider further fluids, and always be watching out for signs of fluid overload. Okay? These are your at risk groups the young, the elderly, the pregnant, those with heart failure, etc., etc. So exercise caution in those patients. Again, in those patients, you might need to consider critical care at an earlier stage because you can't push the fluid as much as you need to. Before we, sorry, um, just a question. Um, before we start on the one litre, have you given any fluid stat? If they're hypovolemic. So only for two, if, if they're hypovolemic, would you give them like one litre stat and then start this? Or If they're hypovolemic, you do your fluid challenges first. Okay. And then, provided you've got a good response to them, you can start on the, on the general regime. Right, so if they're normal volemic, then you just do the yeah. fluid and then fix that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So this is a general guide to your potassium replacement. If it's over 5.5, nothing. If it's between 3.5 and 5.5, you want 40 millimoles in each bag. And if it's below 3.5, you're going to need to be replacing potassium quicker. You need a senior to guide you on that. Don't worry about how you do it. Just make sure a senior is aware and is making an input. Um, how are we measuring the potassium here? Yeah. Ideally, we want to be running this through venous samples, not through the blood gas machine, because their estimate on there is crap. It tends to be that they very grossly underestimate the potassium on the machines. Um, so you want to be running this through the lab as urgent samples. And for the insulin infusion, so commence a fixed rate insulin infusion. So you want to be looking at your hospital guidelines for this. Um, in most places, in most medical wards, they have specific fixed rate insulin infusion charts. So you don't need to think too much, you do what it says. Um, it's generally 15 units of a human soluble insulin, be that atrabid, humulin, made up to 50 mils with normal saline, and a fixed rate would be something like 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. Again, in an ideal situation, this would be already pre-made. Um, you don't need to make it up. And if there is a delay in starting that infusion, then you can consider stat insulin. Uh, 0.1 units per kilogram IV. Okay. Um, if the patient's on long-acting insulin as their regular regime, continue that normal dose, normal times at the same time as this. If there are any short-acting boluses of insulin, scrap that while we're going with this. So that's your first hour. Your aims in the next six hours are to achieve a rate of fall of ketones of at least 0.5 millimoles per litre per hour or in the absence of a ketone meter, measuring bicarbonate, and that should be rising by 3 millimoles per litre per hour. Don't worry about these figures, I don't think they're going to ask you them. Um, blood glucose, you should look to have it falling by about 3 millimoles per litre per hour. Your other aim is to maintain the potassium at the normal range, and avoid hypoglycemia as well. So, in what way are we going to monitor this patient while we've got this fluid going and this insulin going? Yeah, if you're worried. Yeah, how regular? Yeah. Yeah, okay, and we've talked about um, rechecking potassium and things like that as we go along. So, continue to reassess hourly um, capillary blood glucoses, hourly ketones if you've got a meter. Um, you can do a venous blood gas to me measure the pH at one hour, at two hours, and then two hourly from that point onwards. If things are not going as expected, if you're not getting these falls, as you should do, you need a senior input, and again, you might need to be considering critical care, because what you're able to do on the ward is important. <coughs> so, if the glucose gets below 14 millimoles per litre, then you can start to alter your fluid regime. This doesn't mean stop the normal saline, but it means you can add in a bag of glucose. 
So that's something like 10% over 12 hours. Okay? So don't stop the normal saline. Keep that going. Add the glucose in as well. So, we know we've got a resolution of a DKA when we've got ketones of less than 0.3 and a venous pH over 7.3. What do we do now? Okay, change it back to sub-cut, good. How are we going to do it? They start eating. Yeah. They start eating. So we want the patient to wait, able to eat and drink. That's good. And does anyone know when we stop this in comparison to when we start the sub-cut again? We give them the first injection of their like, short bolus and then stop the yeah. insulin. So the guidelines say you want to be carrying on this um, insulin infusion for half an hour after first giving the subcut insulin. Okay. So convert back to an appropriate subcut regime when biochemically stable, the patient is ready and able to eat. Don't stop the IV insulin until half an hour after the subcut regime has been commenced. Get a diabetic team input. Okay. Especially and definitely if this is first presentation diabetes. You might want to have got them on board earlier, not always possible. Um, don't forget the underlying cause. We haven't at any stage through this talked about antibiotics, but if you've had the chest x-ray, you've got confirmed chest infection, you don't treat that, then you're just going to have a similar situation again with the acute infection, um, precipitating another DKA. Fine. That's fine. So that's all I'm going to say about DKA. I'm just going to briefly talk about Addison's and Cushing's just from a recognition point of view, because they're not your act-on ones. They do come up in terms of diagnosing rather than specific management. Um, so we'll quickly talk about them, then we'll do a few slideshows, and then we're done. So Addison's, rare, potentially fatal. It's autoimmune in almost all cases, really. Um, it's a result of autoimmune adrenal cortex destruction, which leads to decreased cortisol and decreased aldosterone. Other causes do happen, but are more rare. TB, adrenal mets. Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, um, but often also mean. So let's go back. Can anyone tell me any features of Addison's that you might see? Clinical presentation. Great. Okay. So purely looking at the person, really, they're lean, they're tanned or pigmented, tired, may have be tearful with depression or psychosis, may have postural hypotension, may have GI disturbance. We talked about the biochemical changes as well. How are we going to investigate Addison's disease? Short snacks and Yeah, short snacks and tests. Okay. That's the diagnostic test. Okay. So you do a cortisol level before the test. You give your synactin IM, and then 30 minutes later, you repeat your cortisol level. And if it doesn't rise to roughly this sort of figure, sorry, if it does rise to roughly this sort of figure, then you've excluded Addison's disease. Okay? How are we going to manage Addison's, just broadly? Yeah, okay. So... If we've just got Addison's disease in a non-acute severe form, yeah, we're going to start a regular daily steroid regime. What do we call it when we've got an acute severe presentation of Addison's disease? Yeah, how are we going to manage that? Yeah, massive shot. How much, anyone know? 200. 100, generally. Might be 200 some places. Guidelines, okay? So, management is steroids, Addisonian crisis. Generally with known Addison's with an additional stressor or due to a sudden cessation of steroids in a patient which doesn't have known Addison's. So you're going to treat it with IV hydrocortisone, IV fluids and treat again with the underlying cause. How many, I know probably don't need to know this, but just to get an image of it, how much do you give them a day? That... About 10 a day, 10 milligrams a day is a general, but then it, it's very, very patient dependent. They'll be under follow up by endocrinologists and they'll adjust regime according to tests as they go. Cushing's is a persistently and inappropriately elevated level of glucocorticoid, usually iatrogenic. 
Can you think of any other causes of Cushing's? Tumor. Yeah. Lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Which tumor? What kind of lung cancer? Yeah. Good. Okay, so a few here. Cushing's disease. What's Cushing's disease? Yeah. Ectopic ACTH secretion. So generally, small cell castle of the, of the bronchus can be at fault. Adrenal adenoma or carcinoma, and there's pseudo Cushing's as well, which is um, in association with alcohol or a severe depressive psychosis. You'll all recognise this woman. These are the general features of Cushing's syndrome. Just be able to read off a few of them. They're all quite distinctive. So, how are we going to diagnose Cushing's? Yeah. So you're thinking of your baseline and random cortisol levels. The most diagnostic way is the dexamethasone suppression test. I wouldn't worry about the ins and outs of it. Just recognise it and know that that's the test for Cushing. So the management is dependent upon the cause. If it's iatrogenic in cause, which is most common, a slow, careful reduction or withdrawal of the steroids to avoid what? Yeah, exactly. What was that? Well, what happens if we suddenly withdraw steroids? Yeah, abstaining crisis and go the other way. Okay. <coughs> um, fine. Going to do a few slideshows. I haven't talked about the whole of endocrinology because there's no time, but it could all come up in my slideshow. Be aware. <laughs> so. Question one. Don't shout it out. Questions will be at the end. What condition does this patient have? What hormone causes the specific picture that you see? And again, broadly and non-specifically, how can you manage this patient? Two. What is wrong with this foot? And what other foot features may this person be displaying? Three causes of this syndrome and three other features this lady may display. disease does this patient have? And try and think of three other symptoms that they may experience. This is the last one. Ulcers. 
diabetic to arteriosclerosis. She's obviously got Cushing's, iatrogenic, any of those that we mentioned would be good there. And then any of the features of that woman that you saw. So hypoglycemia and acidosis, along with this ketonuria, RDKA. Uh, hyperglycemia. <laughs> um, fluids, insulin infusion, and potassium are the first and most important treatments of such. This is Graves' disease. Any other of the hypothyroid type symptoms would have been good. Thank you.